Well, grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ of God, and let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the day that you have given to us, a beautiful day that you have made. You've blessed us already with rain. You've blessed us already with your Spirit's presence here. You've blessed us with beautiful worship. You've gathered us here together on this anniversary day. And we praise and thank you for all the blessings of this year and all your blessings, all your blessings. They are too many for us to count. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for who you are and who you have called us to be and who you have appointed us to be. And we ask, Heavenly Father, that now as we listen to your word, we pray that we might be drawn closer to you. We pray that in fact our hearts would burn and yearn for you. And so we ask, Heavenly Father, that the words of my mouth would be anointed by your Spirit and that our hearts, our minds, our spirits, our souls, our very beings would be anointed to hear it and to receive it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, as I uh, pondered today, being the first anniversary of our gathered together here in this place, and, and also that it's JW's day to profess his faith publicly in Christ Jesus. Um, you know, I asked the Lord, what do you want me to, to preach? What do you want me to proclaim from your word today? And um, when I opened my Bible, my eyes fell upon John 15, and I thought, that's a good one. That's a good one. And actually, I'm going to read all of John 15, a little part of John 16, because I want it all in context. And then from there, I'll go back and make some remarks. But this is what Jesus said to his disciples. Now, this is, after, this is right before his arrest, right before his trial, right before his crucifixion. He said to them, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends, for everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love each other. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. <coughs> Remember the words I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. 
They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. Now, however, they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them what no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now that they have seen these miracles, and yet they have hated both me and my father. But this is to fulfill what is written in the law. They hated me without reason. When the counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the father, the spirit of truth, who goes out from the father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify for you have been with me from the beginning. All this I have told you so that you will not go astray. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he's offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when the time comes, you will remember that I warned you. I did not tell you this at first because I was with you. This is the text for today's thoughts and meditation. This passage is a familiar passage to us. We readily hear, I am the vine and you are the branches. We readily hear, apart from me you can do nothing. And many times we have thought about the fact that we are to be fruit bearers for God. We have heard often that uh, the Father's job is to... Uh, clean off the branches that don't bear fruit so that they can be bundled up and burned. But he would also clean off, that is, prune back the particular branches that are bearing fruit so that they can be even more fruitful. God wants us to be fruitful. But today is not so much about the fruit that we are to bear, but the fact that, I don't know if you noticed this or not, uh, depends on what Bible you're looking at. But how many times did you hear the word remain in that text that I read? Remain, 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 remain. Uh, in a lot of the Bibles that I've got, a lot of the versions, the word is abide. Abide. Well, it just so happens that 11 times in 8 verses, the word abide or remain is used. And that word means it, it is a continual communion with God. Jesus, I mean, Jesus could not have come up with a better analogy for us than to say that the vine, I mean, the branches have got to remain in the vine or else they can't be fruitful. We all know this. We all can see this. All we've got to do is look outside and see branches that are cut off and they're withering. They certainly are not prospering. They certainly are not bearing fruit. They are dying. But the branches that are connected to the trees or connected to the vines, they are bearing fruit. And if somebody knows what they're doing and they know how to prune them back, then they'll be more fruitful. It looks like a like a, a, a very, very painful process to be pruned back. But the results are more fruit. More fruit. And of course what he really wants is fruit that will last. Abiding fruit. Lasting fruit. Um, and so it is that in these verses we hear the word remain 12 times. 12 times. What we find in these particular passages when we hear that this enduring, continual uh, communion with our Lord Jesus, um, that is the way he wants us to be in constant uh, connection to him. In other words, we never leave his presence. We are constantly with him at all times. You know, Jesus... He would constantly commune with his father. He was one of those, I mean, what he did generally is sometimes he spent all night communing with his father. Sometimes he got up in the early morning hours uh, to commune with his father. And that's how he learned what the day's itinerary was. And so, you know, he would go out there. I remember this one time. It was early on in his ministry, and he had done all kinds of miracles. But then he went off to pray. And the disciples 
Cain's family and said, you know, the people are looking for you. And um, our response would be, okay, let's plant a church right here. That wasn't Jesus' response. His response was, we've got to go to other villages too. He didn't sit down and plant a church. He said, the Lord wants me to go elsewhere. I'm not to be in one place. I'm supposed to go out. I mean, look, all of us gathered here. But you know, after this service, we all go out. That's what we do. That's part of what we do. We go out because we've been connected to the vine. We have been nourished, and then we can go out. Well, of course, this isn't the only time that we can be nourished. I mean, we're supposed to remain in the vine at all times. We need to receive that life-giving uh, sustenance from our Lord at all times. The wonderful thing about it is, is that, I mean, we worry about, oh, how do we bear fruit? Or what kind of fruit is acceptable to God and so forth? Do we understand? This is what's, I've been learning this the hard way, mind you. Um, is that if we remain, if we abide in Christ Jesus, the fruit automatically is produced. I mean, you don't have to tell a grapevine to produce grapes. It's in its nature to produce grapes. Okay? Or an apple tree. Or an orange tree. Or a grapefruit tree. Lemon tree or whatever. They produce the kind of tree that they are because the branches are attached to that particular tree. And so it is that if we remain connected to our Lord Jesus, the fruit is going to naturally come out. And we don't have to go, okay, okay, I, oh, uh, uh, let's get that, that fruit out now. <laughs> that looked painful, didn't it? <laughs> no, it's supposed to be natural. A natural outgrowth of who we are in Christ Jesus. That's what Jesus is calling us when he says, abide in me. And I abide in you just as I abide in the Father and he abides in me. And guess what? One of the ways that we show the Father that we're abiding in the Son is by our keeping the commandments. You know, one of the saddest things that probably human beings have done is have put the word commandment in the place of where it should have been instruction. Okay? Because the Ten Commandments were actually the ten words of our Lord. And they're meant to instruct us in how to live. But when we, when we translate them commandments, they sound commanding. Don't they? Yeah. And so we feel like we're under some cloud going, well, when's the lightning going to strike? No. These are words of instruction from our loving God to show us how to live. Because we needed them. Because we got outside of that umbrella when we sinned. When, our, when our Adam and Eve, when our first parents sinned. You know, all of that continual abiding that we had in God was lost. So now he has to show us how to live. And he does it through instruction. He does it through this word of grace. He does it with, you know... Many, many ways, but the first ways was through the, the ten words of instruction, which we call the Ten Commandments. But when you look at the Ten Commandments, and it can be summarized in these two, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's the first and the greatest and the second one like it. You know, you have to put two and two together and say, if, in fact, the summary of the commandments is love of God and love of neighbor, then there's something to this word commandment that has lost its translation for us. And we've got to reclaim it. So we're reclaiming it. It's his instructions to us. His loving instructions to us so that we can be a loving people because the world out there needs our love. 
The world out there needs to see Jesus in us. The world out there wants to experience God through us. It's a, it's a bad place. And it's going to get worse. But you know what? The time that Jesus was giving this passage from John 15 and 16 to his disciples was no different than what it is today. The whole culture was pagan. You know, yes, we had the Jewish people. But even out of that, the Lord was calling out even a, another little subset of people to be his own so that they could then get out into the world that so desperately needed God and take that kingdom message so that that kingdom message could get into the world and continue to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow until it filled the whole earth. Well, our world today is a difficult place for us to be kingdom people, but it's our time now. It's our time now to be the leavening the world needs so that we, they can see us and they can see Jesus Christ in us. So that they can know that the Father, the God that we worship, the God that we love, the God who loves us, loves them too. That's our job. That's our purpose. But Jesus doesn't mince words here. He says, you're going to be hated on my account. We will be hated on account of him. Have you noticed the uptick in the hate that's going on in the world? You know, the different stuff that's going on saying, okay, the Christians can't do this. I was astounded this week. I mean, I know we've got federal government locked down and shut down and all that sort of stuff. But I was st still astounded that they said that the uh, Catholic priests would be subject to arrest if they, if they celebrated Mass on the military basis. Excuse me? Excuse me? You're going to arrest a priest for celebrating Mass? Well, they're contract people. I mean, they're God's people. <laughs> it's like, come on. It's like... Get, up, get, up, get with the program here, people. But you see that uptick, that uptick of trouble is, is starting to swell. And my goodness gracious, every time I have heard more and more and more, every time, well, you know, we got monetary troubles in the world because of the Jews. What? I'm hearing that all over the place. And so it's like, and the Jews are, the Jews are starting to look like deer with the eyes in the headlights because it's starting to happen again. And we said back in the 40s, never forget. So he says, the world is going to hate you. But keep in mind, it hated me first. Nothing's going to happen to you that hasn't happened to me. Okay? We are his representatives. We represent him to the world. We are countercultural by God's design. And the world doesn't like it. The world doesn't like to look at us and see what it could be because it wants to live the way it wants to live. So, we've just got to be ready because these things will increase. Which is all the more reason why we have to keep in mind that it is our absolute need for us to stay in relationship and in that intimate, abiding relationship with Jesus Christ. We've got to have our branch solidly connected to him because even if trouble comes, we're at least connected to the vine and in there there is shelter. He says, I am the one who shelters you. You know, come. He invites to get under the shadow of his wings. And it grieved Jesus when he was grieving over Jerusalem because... He said, how much I would have wanted you to gather you under my wings as a, as a hen would gather her chicks, but you would not. He's calling us to be gathered under those wings of his, that support, that refuge, that shelter, that strong tower, that rock, that kingdom that cannot be shaken. So that, in fact, we can go out into the world and be the gospel light he calls us to be. We do not do this alone. He's given us Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit is not only with us, Holy Spirit is in us. 
to lead and guide and direct, to comfort, to counsel, to teach. Holy Spirit is there to help us in these increasingly difficult days. There are a couple of Bible passages that I'd like to share with you that I just thought about to add, but they fit with what I've said so far. Jesus said in John chapter 16, verse 33, I didn't read it that far, but he says, you know, he says, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. That's where our true peace is, in him. He says, in the world you will have trouble, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And here was a passage, I, you know, I went looking for it, like crazy yesterday, I was looking Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I'm thinking, I know I will never leave you nor forsake you is in there. Well, I needed to widen my search. Back to Joshua. <laughs> it's like, you know, when Moses died, Joshua took over as leadership of the people of Israel. And, um, well, you know, that was a kind of a mighty task because of that stubborn, stiff-necked people that the Israelites were. But this is what the Lord told Joshua, what the Lord is telling us today, okay? Because the Word speaks to every generation. The Word speaks to us. And also I want to tell you that these words about abiding in Jesus is not only for us individually, it's for us corporately as a congregation. So anyway, this is what he said. To Joshua, no one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. And uh, today, since it is uh, JW's day to profess his faith in Christ Jesus, I have given him the passage from Matthew 28, 20b as his verse to memorize, uh, and it is, and behold, I am with you always, even to the close of the age. Jesus had just given the great commission to the disciples. He was going to be, he was going to be leaving, he was sending them out. They had a huge task, <laughs> go and make disciples of all nations, and they're probably thinking, us? And so he says, I am with you. Always, even to the close of the age. He is with us always, even to the close of the age. He is with us always. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. That's our wonderful God. Amen.